Dramatic new video of the arrest of the guy accused of leaking hundreds of classified documents, sending the intel community and allies scrambling. Look at this. Choppers over the suspect's house. And the big question tonight, how did someone who seemed fairly low level get such high impact access? We're also live in Fort Lauderdale, which is bracing for more rain, if you can believe it. After once in a thousand year floods, schools and the airport drenched and closed again. What people there are expecting next. And a pretty stunning development after a top tech executive was stabbed and killed in San Francisco with police now saying the Cash App founder actually knew his suspected attacker. We'll explain. Plus, the most controversial owner in sports may be on his way out. With new reports tonight, Dan Snyder is selling the Washington Commanders. So what does that mean for all those investigations into alleged fraud, sexual harassment, and more? And as Washington tries to crack down on artificial intelligence, We'll tell you about a startup that's using it to try to get you to click on more ads. That's coming up later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are seeing some new and dramatic video of federal law enforcement closing in on the man who they think is behind the leak of hundreds of classified documents. A security breach that's telling us a ton about what the U.S. thinks about the invasion of Ukraine and sending the intelligence community into a scramble. I want to walk you through what our Boston station's choppers caught at the Massachusetts home of Jack to share So you see his red car, this truck parked outside. The FBI, you end up seeing approaching what looks like maybe an armored car out front, other vehicles around too. It's all happening before the moment that you see just about here, the clearest picture of him being patted down, hands behind his back. He's wearing that olive green shirt, red basketball shorts alongside officials decked out in what looks to be military-esque gear, all of it before he's loaded up into the car that you see here, being taken away to the FBI field office in Boston, where he just arrived in the last hour or so. Here's what we know about him. Teixeira is 21 years old and a member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard. He's been in uniform about three and a half years. His official job title is Cyber Transport Systems Journeyman. We're going to talk about that in a second. Our law enforcement sources say he's been on their radar for a while. Attorney General Merrick Garland taking no questions when naming to share it today, only to say that he was arrested, I'm quoting here, without incident. I want to get right to Ken Delanian, who is outside the Justice Department for us tonight. No official word on motive yet, Ken. Some have reported it out, but the big question everybody has, this guy worked for the, you know, the Massachusetts National Guard, basically. At first glance, at first blush, that job title seems to be on the low-level side of things. How did somebody there get access to such sensitive documents to then be suspected of leaking them? That's the million dollar question, Hallie. And our colleague Courtney Cuby has answered it in part by reporting that he was essentially an IT specialist, which gave him greater access to material than a normal airman at that level uh, and rank would have had. And what's amazing about this to me is this is exactly the situation with Edward Snowden 10 years ago. Edward Snowden had would quote unquote super user status inside the National Security Agency. His job was to migrate data and fix systems and he had administrative access, which gave him access to the keys to the kingdom, almost everything that was coursing through those servers and he leaked a lot of it. Well, it looks like some of the same thing may have happened here. This airman, uh, 21 years old, born after 9-11, uh, is now accused of unauthorized retention and disclosure of classified information. He is suspected of having been the person who disclosed all these images of highly classified documents that we've been seeing in recent days. Uh, according to reporting in the Washington Post and the New York Times, he posted them to a chat room uh, on Discord, a gaming platform, chat room called Thug Shaker, where there were a group of people uh, he was close to over a number of years. And according to some of these people, he began posting highly, highly classified material as long as a year ago. But it appears that the U.S. government only became aware of this about a week ago when the story broke. Uh, and, you know, the media found this guy before the FBI named him, but I'm told by my law enforcement sources that they have been on to him for many days, Howard. So what's so interesting here, Ken, is you're laying out um, this guy, apparently an IT specialist, right? So you think, okay, how do you tighten up security so this doesn't happen again? If you're the Pentagon, that is clearly what they would want to do here. The press secretary there calling it a deliberate criminal rank, but also saying, yeah, somebody with this rank and age, et cetera, could have access to this. I want to play a little bit from that. And if you are uh, working in the intelligence community uh, and you require a security clearance, you're going to go through the proper vetting. We entrust our members uh, with a lot of responsibility at a very early age. Again, this guy, 21 years old, the suspect here. How, 
If the Pentagon wants to tighten up security, how do they do it, Ken? Like, right, what steps can they realistically take to prevent something like this down the road? Well, there are two issues here. One with IT. Back in the Snowden days, they said they're going to have two people, an, uh, kind of a fail-safe system so that no one person would have access to all this information. Apparently, that didn't happen in this case. But the other issue is monitoring people with security clearances. They said after Snowden that they, they were going to adopt what's called continuous monitoring, not just every five years you do a background check, but continually looking at people's social media, at their bank records, at other things that could raise a red flag. It's pretty clear that there aren't enough resources devoted to this because there are tens and tens of thousands of yeah. people who have high-level security clearances in our burgeoning national security state, Howard. We need to talk about the substance here, right? This leak happened. It is obviously, I think it's fair to say, egg on the face of the intel community of the fact that this happened at all, that this leak occurred. The president was really careful, President Biden, when talking about this today. Watch. I'm not concerned about the leakages. and I'm concerned that it happened. But there is nothing contemporaneous that I'm aware of that is of great consequence. So nothing contemporaneous of great consequence, he says. Help us parse this, Ken, because there is information that is now out there based on these leaks yeah. that both allies and adversaries would have an interest in for different reasons. Part of that is Joe Biden being defensive, knowing he's going to be attacked mm. by Republicans. But he has a point in the sense that uh, these these reports were snapshots in time. There was nothing in there about ongoing intelligence operations and nothing about human sources. And so some of the things that were described in these intelligence reports did not come to pass. Uh, and so um, but. They're fairly recent, about as recent as I've seen. And there's some very sensitive information, for example, about uh, holes in Ukraine's air defenses that I, I saw a senior member of Congress say today could get Ukrainians killed. So if I were in the government, I would never want to minimize the seriousness and, uh, of this. And the people that I'm talking to in the intelligence community are very rattled by this disclosure, Howard. Ken Delaney, and thank you so much. We're going to, I know, have you standing by in case there are more developments on this tonight. Appreciate it. Let's take it down south where there is a state of emergency tonight in the city of Fort Lauderdale and the area around it. With more rain, if you can believe it, maybe on the way, the airport and schools shut down still after a torrential downpour overnight. The most rain in that city's history in one day. People now dealing with not inches, feet of water. Look at this. Look at what these cars are driving through. Homes are damaged. Logistical nightmares at the Fort Lauderdale Airport, where the flooded runways will stay closed until at least tomorrow. And you can see why by just looking at this. A wall of water at the airport there. Yeah, that is why terminals are shut down. Schools in Broward County, they are out of operation also. Officials today not even speculating about when classes may pick up again. Let me show you how much rain fell in this greater area. 18 inches in Hollywood, 17 in Dania Beach, 15 in the city of Plantation, nearly two feet in Fort Lauderdale. Joining me now, NBC's Guad Venegas, who is in Fort Lauderdale. Bill Karens, our meteorologist, is with us too. Guad, people are used to rain. It rains in South Florida, but not like this. And here it is coming down yet again. Uh, Greg Halley, so we know that we get a lot of rain in this part of the country, but this amount of rain and just that amount of time was too much uh, for the system. You can see the runway behind me here at Fort Lauderdale International Airport. Uh, the best way to describe it is it looks like a lake. It has been this way since last night with people stranded inside the terminals. A lot of them had to sleep inside. Uh, others that were on the way to the airport yesterday were stranded in their vehicles. Some had to walk through water with their luggage and hoping that today the airport would reopen and the water here would recede. We now know that that did not happen. And as you can see, it's now coming down hard uh, again. We spoke to yeah. some of the passengers that were stranded in the terminal, including a woman who had to sleep inside with her four daughters. This is what she told us. It's so I think we maybe night. got a no four blood. hours of sleep and it was freezing. It's either hopefully tomorrow night like for Miami or Fort Lauderdale or nothing until Sunday or Monday. So that's just one example of, of a family that had to sleep uh, inside the terminal. They were going to try to get a car rental and uh, go to a different airport in a different part of Florida to eventually make it back home. And as you can see, this is the type of rain yeah. uh, that came down overnight yesterday that brought these uh, up to 25 inches. I mean, 
you, I, I don't have to describe uh, the type of weather we get here, but these are the conditions. As many parts of Fort Lauderdale, not just the airport, but other neighborhoods, are still flooded from what came down yesterday, Hallie. Guad Venegas, uh, I, we, we talk more. I want to make sure that you get to a dry and safe place. I see your photographer there wiping the lens. Thank you for his hard work, too. It's almost unbelievable to think these people who have dealt with so much in the last 24 hours are now seeing yet another downpour. Guad, thank you. We'll check back in with you in a bit. Let me get to Bill Karens. When's the rain going to stop, Bill? That's what people there want to know. Hallie, this is ridiculous. You have to remember, this is spring break. I actually flew through Fort Lauderdale Airport on Saturday. I saw pictures of the bus that I took to the rental car place that had people in it with their feet up because there was water in the bus. I know exactly how bad that flooding is, and it's completely flat. It's almost like a lake now. It's going to wow. take forever for that water to drain. And I can only imagine what the airport and county officials are thinking right now, seeing how hard it is pouring. The, the water didn't go down that much today. And now they're going to get another one to three inches of rain in the next couple hours on top of everything yesterday. I mean, it, it, can you imagine? They may not be able to open the airport tomorrow. Uh, a horrific situation. So here's the deal. Those thunderstorms, here's where Guad was located, right here where my finger is, just south of downtown Fort Lauderdale. They are under severe thunderstorm warning, and they are under a brand new flash flood warning as this slow-moving storm will be over you. It's not yesterday. It's not 20 inches, but an additional three inches is certainly not helping things. And this time, it's not just areas that are down Fort Lauderdale. We have strong thunderstorms around Daytona Beach. We have a tornado watch up here in the Georgia, and we have two new tornado warnings here. Let's look at one of them near Tomb Central. This is mostly rural sections of South Central Georgia. We haven't had any confirmed tornadoes, but that's an active tornado warning here. So, you know, the tornado sirens are going off. People are getting into their shelters, and that's happening now. The rest of this evening, we have about 10 million people at risk. It's that east coast of Florida, back to that area in southern Georgia for the best chance of those storms. And then other areas of concern, it's hot, it is dry. We have fires burning in areas of Arizona uh, and also in New Mexico. Seven fire incidents in Arizona. New Mexico's got four, and it is extremely dry and hot in so many areas. Hallie, it hit 90 degrees in New York City today. Newark Airport is at 91 degrees. Wow. That was a record in Central Park. It's the first time that New York City has hit 90 in April since 2010. And it's only the 20th time in New York City's history that they've hit 90 in April. And that goes back to the mid-1800s. There's some weird weather happening uh, along the East Coast and through yeah. parts of the country here tonight. Bill Karens, thank you very much for watching this. Appreciate it. We're also watching tonight the fight over an abortion pill getting another step closer to the Supreme Court with the Department of Justice planning to ask the justices to block a new ruling making it harder to get this pill. This is after an appeals court overnight basically stopped this medication from being able to be sent to patients in the mail. If the Supreme Court doesn't weigh in, this could kick in as soon as Saturday. What would it mean? It means women would have to go to a doctor's office to get this pill. They'd have to take it under the supervision of a doctor. They wouldn't be able to just take it at home or get it sent to them. It's all coming as Florida lawmakers have just in the last couple of minutes passed what could become one of the strictest abortion bans in the country. I want to bring in Dasha Burns, who is on the ground in Tallahassee there. And Dasha, let me start with that news that's developed in the last couple of minutes here. We are seeing yet another state make a move to restrict access to abortion. This time it's Florida. This time is Florida, but it's not just going to impact Florida, Hallie. If you look at a map, you've got Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana with all-out bans, Georgia with a heartbeat ban. So Florida was sort of a, a looked at as almost a sanctuary state in the South, even though Florida itself had a pretty strict 15-week ban prior to this bill. But still, it was one of the, the states in the area that people could actually access abortion care, period. Now that door seems to be closing as just moments ago the Florida House of Representatives passed the six-week abortion ban here. It has already made its way through the Senate, so it's made its way through the legislature. Next, it heads to the governor's desk, and it passed today amid a lot of action here, Hallie. We had uh, protesters here in the Capitol protesting both inside and outside of the chamber. At one point, the gallery in the chamber actually had to be cleared because of the disruptions. Take a look at that moment. You have responsibilities to maintain the decorum in the Florida House. If you can't maintain the decorum, I will ask the sergeant to escort you to a room where you can watch the proceedings on the television.
demonstrators throwing paper um, onto the House floor. They had stories uh, of abortion, uh, stories of, of trans folks, different uh, appeals to the lawmakers there. Now uh, the bill heads to the governor's desk, and we will see, Hallie, it'll be interesting politically just how public Florida yeah. Governor Ron DeSantis makes that bill signing, considering his um, upcoming likely bid for the White House. So you've laid out what's happening in Florida, what this means for the South, given this news that has just developed here. Pull back nationally. And Dasha, I want you to, as much as you can, pragmatically and practically, what is the status of access to the abortion pill in this country right now? I think we made it pretty clear at the top, women, if this ruling is not taken up by the Supreme Court, cannot get this medication by mail, they'd have to go to the doctor's office. What else? That's exactly right. We're basically back in the year 2000 now, right mm -hmm. after the FDA approved this drug, which means that women cannot have it prescribed via telemedicine. That's a change the Biden administration made during the pandemic. It's going from uh, 10 weeks being allowed to, uh, to prescribe it to women at 10 weeks of pregnancy back down to seven weeks. You do have to take it in the doctor's office now, as you mentioned before. This was a big thing for women, especially in rural areas where you have to make that trek to the doctor's office to be able to take this medication at home. It takes some time to work. It's, it's, it can be an uncomfortable and unpleasant and painful experience, Hallie. So this will change the way that women are able to take this medication, and it will limit access just because of those practicalities of how difficult right. it is uh, for a lot of women in this country to, to get to a doctor's office to get this kind of prescription. Dasha Burns, live for us in Tallahassee. Dasha, thank you very much. So take a look at this. You see former President Trump there. You're about to see him in some black SUVs passing by. Back in New York City, it's that car right there, facing more legal challenges. And you can see some protesters out today. It is a civil case in this instance, being led by the state's attorney general, Letitia James. She's accusing Mr. Trump, along with three of his kids, of illegally manipulating how much their assets are worth. Why? She says to mislead banks, tax officials, insurance companies. If the AG wins, she could block the Trump family and his company from running businesses in New York. They could also face a $250 million fine. In a statement, Mr. Trump's lawyer says he's got nothing to hide, that he looks forward to telling the AG about how successful his company is. As we know, the civil case is just one of multiple cases that the former president finds himself involved in. You see them on your screen, including the one that's the highest profile, of course, the one you've heard about most recently, those 34 felony charges he's facing, accused of lying about business records related to alleged hush money payments. Rahema Ellis is outside the New York Attorney General's office in Manhattan. So we know, Rahema, that the last time that the former president sat for a deposition in this case, he pleaded the fifth. He pleaded the fifth something like 400 times. But this is not like a criminal case. This is a civil case, and that matters because of how a jury could see him pleading the fifth if he did that again, right? You're absolutely right. The jury could look at this in an adverse way, and it could not work well for the former president. Uh, what you said just a few minutes ago about his attorney issuing a statement after his client had gone into the attorney general's office, suggesting that he is willing and eager to tell his side. The former president was even saying this himself so much. He was foreshadowing, if you will, on the uh, social media platform last night and this morning, saying that uh, he thinks that this case is ridiculous uh, and it should be dismissed. And he has a story to tell. He has a great company. And he wants to talk about it. So he's been in there about seven hours. Uh, it's been a long day. We haven't heard anything. We've seen huh. the, uh, some posters have, have, have come back. And at some point, maybe we'll find out what he did have to say before the attorney general. Alex. He's now, he has long, since this case has at least been on the radar, at least, attacked the attorney general there, Letitia James. He says that she is racist, that she's, you know, doing this for political reasons, basically. He's been trying to push back discovery. But right now, it seems like the judge is holding pretty tight to this October 2nd trial date, right? It sure does. Um, the Trump uh, organization would like very much to push it to September. They say they want more time in order to review the documents that the attorney general has gathered. But the uh, judge says right now he's not having any of it as far as he's concerned. This is going to court on October 2nd. Rahema Ellis, live for us in New York. Thank you. First day of jury selection in that hugely high-profile Dominion Fox trial is just wrapping up in the last hour. And even though the judge had to find folks that had little to no opinion of Fox or Dominion, not an easy task, the court says they found enough potential jurors to send everybody else home. It means a jury will be seated Monday.
Comes as the judge is also denying requests from media organizations like NBC News to broadcast any bit of the trial from court. This whole process, when finished, right, is going to mean 12 jurors, six alternates, to decide whether Fox defamed Dominion, a voting tech company, by airing lies about their products, conspiracy theories, essentially, after the 2020 election. We're talking about false claims of connections to the dead Venezuelan leader Hugo Chavez, paid kickbacks to politicians, and rigged voting machines that flipped votes to then-candidate Joe Biden. Again, things with zero evidence that were put out. This is the biggest defamation case to go to trial in recent memory. It's got major implications for the First Amendment and protections that the media has had for decades. NBC's Jane Tim is at the courthouse now in Wilmington, Delaware. She is joining us from just outside. Jane, let me start with what we saw in jury selection. It sounds like it went fairly quickly that they assembled at least a pool of potential jurors. And a lot of the questioning related to things like... What do you think of Fox? What have you heard about Dominion, right? Walk us through it. Absolutely. They're looking for people who aren't going to be relying on their personal knowledge from outside the courtroom and making their determinations. I want to read you a few of the questions these jurors were asked. And this is a long list of questions that all these jurors were asked. Things like, do you avoid any Fox News programs on television mm -hmm. or on any social media? And if so, would this affect your ability to be fair and impartial? Have you or a family member or a close friend ever worked in a newsroom? The kind of thing that might inform an opinion if you come home here and about how news is done. This is what they're trying to do to weed these people out. Uh, Delaware is a small state, so sometimes conflicts don't get you taken out of a jury pool. Uh, I did was sitting in the media room earlier, and a reporter walked in who covers this courtroom. He was called for jury duty, as he said, it's Delaware, of course I was. And he said, you know what? He got to the question, and they were like, you know what? You have too much personal knowledge about this. We're going to pull you out of that jury pool. And he was excused as expected. It's, it's super interesting here. When you look at Fox, one of their big arguments is that what they air is protected by the First Amendment. No matter how the case is, is decided, this is not just about Fox News and Dominion, right? There are going to be winners and losers beyond just the scope of those two organizations here. Absolutely. This goes all the way down to the election workers who are working the polls and whether or not those machines are Dominion. The local elected officials who hear conspiracy theories about Dominion in their board of supervisors meetings. But this comes down to, you know, if they're if the Dominion wins, this could absolutely fuel copycat cases about uh, what people say, how they fact check, how they uh, sort of ask questions on the air. Uh, but if Fox News wins, it, it could also uh, to lead people to say, like, what's the def defamation? If, 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 if you can't win it in this case. Obviously, that's an argument here. We're going to have to see how the evidence plays out in this specific court. Uh, but it, it's clear that this is going to spawn future cases as it continues to do now. Jane Tim, live for us there in Wilmington, Delaware. I'm sure we'll talk again in the days and the weeks to come. Jane, thank you very much. We are just learning that that huge toxic fire at a recycling plant in Indiana is fortunately almost out. In just the last couple of minutes, we've heard from the city's fire chief saying that this thing that's been burning for more than two days might finally be extinguished by tonight. It doesn't mean schools are going to reopen, though. They're going to stay closed tomorrow again for a third day. And people are still evacuated with no timeline on when they'll be able to get back to their homes. You saw those huge black clouds of smoke kind of starting to turn gray now. This is from today. Look at the sky there. Our reporters on the ground say the smell of burning plastic is actually stronger than ever. We're starting to see, and you see it here, what little is left of that factory, the sort of debris left behind. With the big question tonight, who will be held accountable for all this? The city's already in a court fight with the owner of this plant over a possible fire hazard even before this fire started. Jesse Kirsch is live for us near this scene in Indiana. So, okay, Jesse, it is obviously good news that this fire could be out as soon as tonight after burning for something like 48 hours. But what does it mean for people who still can't go home or still get their kids back to class? Yeah, so Hallie, as you mentioned, schools are closed again tomorrow, and where we are right now is still in the middle of an evacuation zone with a half-mile radius around what is left of this facility. You can see behind me here the rubble. You can see this charred, what appears to be brickwork from back here, and we've still seen the fire hoses going off. But one thing we're really not seeing as much of now is a massive plume of smoke. That is something that obviously has been going here for days now, and officials say that the fire at this point is 90% extinguished, so that is great news. But 
Uh, we've had a shift in the smoke with the wind and the temperature outside even is changing where the smoke is oriented in this community. And even beyond the evacuation zone, people are being asked to wear masks and shelter in place, especially on the east side. That was the recommendation earlier, at least, on the east side of this plume of smoke. And something that we know has been found here are volatile organic compounds. That's what officials said at a press conference earlier today. They haven't gotten more specific on what those compounds are. So we're waiting for further testing results. And in this community, officials have said they're not going to be having people return home if it is not yet safe. So obviously, there's still outstanding results that they're waiting for in this community, even as the fire continues to be battled. Jesse Kirsch, live for us in Richmond. Jesse, thank you very much for that update. Coming up here on the show, thousands of people in Texas about to find out if they're going to lose their whole library system over a fight about banned books. We've got a live look inside the meeting happening now, coming up. Plus, the Women's Tennis Association doing a pretty big U-turn when it comes to its China boycott. We'll tell you why in the five things. We are learning tonight from police that the tech executive killed in San Francisco last week apparently knew the man suspected of stabbing him. Police say Nima Mameni is a tech consultant and that he's expected to be arraigned tomorrow. Remember, the death of Bob Lee, who you see here, the Cash App founder, really triggered this debate nationally over safety in San Francisco, with the DA using the announcement of this new arrest today to call out Elon Musk who tweeted after the killing that violent crime in San Francisco is horrific. Listen. Reckless and irresponsible statements like those contained in Mr. Musk's tweet that assumed incorrect circumstances about Mr. Lee's death serve to mislead the world in their perceptions of San Francisco and also negatively impact the pursuit of justice for victims of crime. The arrest comes just over a week after Lee was found stabbed just before 3 a.m. Nyala Charles is joining us now. So, Nyala, that is a strong statement, of course, from that DA. Walk us through what else we know here, how these two may have known each other. What happens next here? Well, so far, the police chief isn't releasing, Hallie, more information on exactly how they knew each other. He says it's still an open investigation. And because of that, there's still a lot of uh, things that they're trying to put together here. He says they do have evidence that they knew each other, but the key thing is how. We do know they're both in the tech industry. But another important thing, Hallie, here, police say they believe Lee was stabbed with a knife. So we do have that information as well. Um, do they have any sense of motive specifically? Still haven't released a possible okay. motive here, but we do expect and hope to learn more about that tomorrow when the suspect is arraigned in court. We do know that prosecutors will be requesting no bail for the suspect. And because of that, they will have to argue to the judge why they believe that's necessary. So it is possible that within that argument, we will learn more about that. Hallie? We showed some pieces of that news conference just within the last maybe 90 minutes or so, and there was a lot of discussion about accountability. We've talked about it on this show, right? San Francisco kind of fighting what in some ways is a PR battle nationally. There are those um, politically on the right who point to San Francisco and say it is evidence that crime is out of control in this more liberal-leaning city. You've obviously got people in San Francisco working to defend its city's reputation. Give us the gut check and the reality check on the statistics here, right? Because this is this is really coming to light after what happened to Mr. Lee. Holly, well, we do know within the last couple of years, violent crime in San Francisco has gone up, although the DA says most recently they're seeing a decrease in crime in various areas. Today in the press conference, the DA did express her frustration with the response to Lee's death in regards to how people were talking about San Francisco, assuming really that this was a random crime. So because of that, there was a lot of reignited conversation about safety in San Francisco and the feeling that it is an unsafe city. So today, the DA was fighting against that narrative along with the police chief. This is what he said. Take a listen. Just put it in any other city. I don't believe it would have changed the circumstances one bit. This is not about San Francisco. It happened in San Francisco, and that is unfortunate. It's even more of a tragedy that it happened at all. But this speaks to more about human nature. So again, there, the police chief saying that this has to do with more so the relationship between the suspect and Bob Lee. Hallie? 
Niall Charles live for us in California with that. Thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the top Republican in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, says he will be back at work Monday in person. Remember, he'd been working from home the last few weeks, ever since he got out of a rehab center. He tripped and fell at a dinner in D.C. last month and was hospitalized. Number two, California Senator Dianne Feinstein is asking to be temporarily put, replaced rather, on the Senate Judiciary Committee while she recovers from shingles. We brought you as breaking news on the show 24 hours ago that she's facing now the first calls on the record from members of Congress to step down from fellow Democrats. Her critics have suggested that her absence has slowed down how many confirmations President Biden can get for his judicial nominees. Feinstein, who's 89 years old, has not voted in the Senate since February. Number three, President Biden overseas tonight attending a big banquet in Ireland at Dublin Castle after meeting with the country's president and prime minister and speaking with parliament. Listen. If you forgive the poor attempted Irish, Tamasha Walia, I'm at home. Tomorrow, the president is planning to visit another area that is close to him personally before returning back to Washington. Number four, the Women's Tennis Association says it'll start doing events in China later this year, ending its boycott. Why did it start that boycott? Do you remember back in 2021, there were safety concerns about former player Peng Shuai. She had accused a high-ranking Chinese official of sexual assault and then basically disappeared. She dropped out of the view of people the public. The WTA says the situation has shown no, sh no sign of changing and that they needed a different approach. They say they've been in touch with people close to Peng Shuai and are assured she is living safely in Beijing. Number five, California's Disneyland says its Splash Mountain ride will close at the end of May. It's a ride that got a lot of criticism for its racist roots. It's been around more than 30 years. It'll get a total makeover and will reopen next year, inspired by the Princess and the Frog. Disney World's Splash Mountain closed back in January. Some big news in the football world. The owner of the Washington Commanders is reportedly close to a deal to sell his team for... The low, low price of $6 billion, that would be a record for any sports franchise in North America, right? Now, you're like, Hallie, wait a second. Why are you talking about the sale of a sports team? Why is that national news? Dan Snyder is not just any owner of any sports team, right? He is an owner who is in the spotlight in a serious way, facing a series of allegations from a toxic culture that includes alleged sexual harassment of cheerleaders and female employees, to alleged financial misconduct and bank fraud. Congress is looking into some of this. Snyder has denied all of the allegations you see on screen there. The reported new owners are led by a group that includes Josh Harris, who also owns the Sixers in Philly and the NHL's New Jersey Devils, and NBA Hall of Famer Magic Johnson, who's a part owner of the LA Dodgers. Ben Standing joins me now, a senior writer for The Athletic, who covers the Commanders. Uh, uh, I know there are Commanders fans out there tonight, Ben, who are like, finally, Relief. I mean, I know some of those Commanders fans personally, right? But this is certainly not a done deal yet, the sale. Not a done deal. They've come to an agreement in principle. It's not exclusive, though. So in theory, somebody else could jump in. There was uh, another group coming out of Canada that had that, that put in a bid for essentially the same $6 billion. So I think they still think they're involved. Okay. But at this point, it looks like Josh Harris. The, I think the big question that a lot of people have, and I will tell you a big question that I have, because we've covered the saga of Dan Snyder and these allegations, again, in D.C. Con like, there's a lot to this. What does this potential sale mean for all of those investigations against Snyder? We heard from the lawyers who represent more than 40 commander's employees who say today marks the end of a long and difficult chapter for workers. Tell me what this means writ large for those accusations. I think those accusations are still going forward. The uh, There's a... D.C. Has, uh, has a situation right. going on involving not just the insider, but the NFL and how everything's been handled. Uh, Eastern District of Virginia is looking into bank fraud. Uh, the in NFL's own investigation, uh, for, led by uh, right. Mary Jo White, still looking into allegations made against Dan Snyder specifically, as well as um, how the, the, the uh, organization handled their own finances. All these things are still going forward. What happens? Do we start? Do we continue to talk about it in the same way? I don't know about that. Dan Snyder supposedly was looking for uh, cover from the league if he were to go ahead and sell. And I think that is a question that we all have asked. Is he going to be held accountable if, uh, you know, what, depending on what happens? Pull that thread. Explain what you mean. Do you mean that if he becomes now a former owner, that perhaps the NFL might not be so, the speculation is that the NFL would be less aggressive in going after him? Or, or help, me, well, help us understand that. In terms of the, their own investigation, right. I think we all are kind of wondering 
what's going to happen. Okay. Roger Goodell just repeated the other day at the uh, owners meeting that they will release these findings. Okay. What those findings will look like, that's going to be the question. And you know, how scrubbed over is it, I guess. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But the rest of it, yeah, everybody's still going forward. I believe I saw uh, the D.C. Uh, Attorney General today said they are still moving forward on their case, and the Washington Post reported that. So, yeah, he, Dan Snyder is not off the hook as far as we know with any of this, but nonetheless, it, it may, it, people may pull back to a degree if that. he's out of the way. A question mark is what you're saying there. Yeah. Sure, sure, he may not be off the hook. He's going to be richer by a lot because six billion dollars is a tremendous amount of money i don't think i have to tell you that or anybody that he bought the team for 800 million dollars back in 1999. what was the leverage factor here how did he get so much for this team is it because the nfl writ large is just so darn lucrative right even if it view, it's viewed like dan snyder selling a distressed property it's not it's the nfl yeah. it is the cash cow of cash cows and people want to get into that oh, exclusive club. There's only obviously 32 owners for these teams. Uh, so yeah, that, that's why people were willing to do it. Josh Harris, as we mentioned, he last year tried to buy the Denver Broncos, mm. came up short there. He obviously owns an NBA and an NHL team. Now he adds to that portfolio. Um, Magic Johnson was with him trying to get the Denver bid. Now he's here as well. So yeah, whatever Dan Snyder is dealing with, they want the team. You know, it's funny. A lot of people in DC, there was some speculation. Could it be Jeff Bezos? Could he be making him play? It turns out not the case here. That would always seem to be a bit a, a weird wishful one. thinking yeah. that people are like, it makes sense on some levels, but he, and he did show some interest, but never got any real sense that he was a real bidder on this. Ben Standick, thank you very much. I'm sure this is not the last time we'll talk. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Coming up here on the show, we've got a little bit of breaking news coming into us. A Texas county has just voted on whether to shut down a library system that helps thousands of people over a fight on a book ban. We've got the results of that coming up in just a second. tonight. A Texas county has just voted to keep its entire public library system open after threatening essentially going nuclear and shutting them all down because they'd been ordered to unban a bunch of books. We have members of our NBC News team's affiliate down in the area in Llano County inside this commissioner's special meeting where people were speaking out, talking about, hey, keep the libraries open, shut them down so we don't have to bring back these books we wanted to be banned. Listen to what was going down just within the last couple of minutes. The books that are in the library are not pornographic. None of them are. The list that she received, have you read any of them? I am in favor of closing the libraries temporarily until we find a solution to the pornographic filth we do have. So you hear folks on both sides there. This is a small community just outside Austin that's become the basically latest front line in the so-called culture war. Over about a dozen books, most of them for kids, like the classic In the Night Kitchen by Maurice Sendak, but also some books about race and social justice, like Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent. There was a lawsuit filed by some people who live in Llano when these books were banned, and a federal judge said, hey, it's actually not constitutional to ban them. He said, you got to put them back into circulation. Aaron Gilchrist has been following the latest on this story. So when that judge said, hey, put it back into circulation, some of these officials in this county said, uh, you know, we're going to just maybe shut down the library system instead. They didn't actually do that, though. Yeah, no, it's it, we, we were watching this very closely, and the producer, uh, Ben, was texting me about this as I was sitting waiting to come in here. Shout out, Ben. Yeah, yep. on top of it for sure. And essentially, the the, the judge there, the, the county executive, came back from a, a closed session, executive session, and said, you know what? Uh, we banned these books because not enough people were checking them out. That was part of the argument they made last year in, in, in this case. It, it, it didn't I thought they really... were banning them because of the content. Well... They didn't say that outright. That was the sort of the accusation on the other side, that it was really a censorship move, not so much a circulation move. And, and honestly, in most circumstances, librarians make decisions about how to move books around mm. if there's a circulation issue. It's unusual for the county to step in and make something like that happen. Uh, and he essentially accused the plaintiffs in this case of forcing the county to sort of run up the bill, paying for these legal procedures. And they said, you know what? All right, fine. We're not going to close the libraries. The libraries will stay open and the books will have to go back on the shelves in order for 
uh, the county to meet the requirement from the judge. You talked to one of the people who live in this county who brought a lawsuit, brought that lawsuit that basically said, we don't want these books to be banned. Tell, tell me more about that conversation. Yeah, we talked to Leela Green Little, uh, who was sort of the leader of the group of plaintiffs in this case, and, and she essentially said that, you know, this is censorship and it's not okay. It's not something that she uh, wanted to see in the county libraries. It's not something a lot of people, a lot of folks who spoke, uh, a dozen or so people spoke to not tonight at that meeting, uh, and most of them were in favor of keeping the libraries open. Mm -hmm. A few people spoke, and they talked about uh, there being porn in some of these books without really explaining why they felt that way or talking about uh, what they thought qualified as, as porn. But I want you to hear a little bit from Leela and, and what her reasoning is about why this was uh, a case that she wanted to uh, fight, an idea that she wanted to fight in terms of banning books and closing the libraries. It's awful. It's horrifying. And um, it's deeply disappointing to me um, to know that my county is uh, even considering uh, closing down a public library system. Um, I can tell you that the concept of book banning is incredibly unpopular across um, all political persuasions and, and, you know, independents, Republicans and Democrats. It and it seems though, as though the debate here is going to continue, though. There were people who spoke at this meeting who said they wanted these books that they deemed pornographic children's books to be moved to a part of the library where only adults could have access mm. to them uh, or close the library. And so the, the, the push to do something isn't over. I have to ask, just because we showed it on the graphic and people might have this question, one of the books is about a farting leprechaun. What's the objectionable piece of that? So if if you uh, there, I've never read it, I don't know, and I haven't read it either. But there's there's that book. There's another book that references you know butts and farts, and, and it's a children's book. And I think if you think about the copper copper tone baby, uh, uh, that that image of the dog pulling the shorts, I think it's something along those lines, cartoonish, that some people feel is inappropriate for children to have access to. Aaron Gilchrist, it is a, an interesting resolution for now to yeah. this piece of the puzzle. But you have to think that given how widespread some of the these moves to ban books is becoming across the country. It's probably not the last. Not the last, right. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you so much. Coming up here on the show, why protesters in France who are really mad about this plan to raise the retirement age are now targeting a luxury giant. Plus, it wasn't diamonds, it wasn't dollar bills. It was a million dimes, almost, stolen from a trailer in Pennsylvania. Look at this. We've got the investigation happening now in the local. Tonight, more protests across France, a new wave, really, with hundreds of thousands of people marching across the country against the president's unpopular plan to raise the retirement age. You had demonstrators, look at this, swarming the Paris headquarters of luxury giant LVMH, saying the French government should tax the rich more instead of pe making people work longer for their pensions. The head of that company, Bernard Arnault, is reportedly the world's richest person. We've also seen confrontations in Bastille Square, police stepping in, look at this, using tear gas to try to separate out the crowds. All of this comes ahead of an important day on Friday when the sort of highest constitutional authority in France will lay out its decision on this pension change, this retirement plan change. Protesters are not going to be allowed to demonstrate near where the vote is happening now from tomorrow until Saturday morning. Ali Arouzi is joining us now live from Paris. So tomorrow... You got this reform law that goes to a vote. Is it possible they could scrap the plan or scrap parts of it? Well, Holly, this entire fate of this bill now lands, uh, is in the hands of this uh, Constitutional Council, and they could decide to scrap it altogether or fully support President Macron. Now, traditionally, that council has usually supported the president's office, and the conventional wisdom here is that they will do so again tomorrow, perhaps with some caveats. And the reason is that most of the people on that council are seen as Macronists. They see eye to eye with him on this uh, pension reform plan. They think this is needed to balance the books in the country. And if that doesn't happen, the situation here could be far worse. And they're very keen to resolve this situation because the country has come to a sort of a standstill. These strikes have affected everything here from air transport, ground transport, health care, oil refineries, schools, and even garbage collection. So it's really, really affecting the economy and the day-to-day -day works of the country. And they want to resolve it. But what's for sure, Halley, is whether this bill goes through or not tomorrow, the divide between these two sides couldn't be bigger. 
Uh, what's interesting here, too, is that Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, is set to visit Notre Dame with his wife tomorrow before they sort of mark the anniversary of the fire there. He's getting out in the streets, protests be damned in some ways. What's, what's the sense of the reporting around his attitude towards this tonight, meaning the protests, the demonstrations, the controversy now that has been lasting for weeks over this pension change plan? Well, it's a kind of a message from Macron that it's just another day at the office. It's a business as usual. And he's probably feeling pretty confident that this bill is going to go through tomorrow, possibly with a caveat or two, and he will have gotten his way. And of course, Kali, he doesn't have that much to lose. He keeps saying that he doesn't mind how unpopular this bill uh, makes him, but he doesn't have to worry about opinion polls and getting reelected because the French constitution only allows two terms. So it doesn't matter if this bill goes through and he's terribly unpopular. But what a lot of commentators here are saying is that he hasn't really selected a clear leader to follow him in his party. And if this bill does go through and there's still a lot of commotion in this country, it again, it hangs in the balance. There's no clear leader to make sure it works. And the argument here is that he just hasn't gone about this properly. There is an argument for raising the pension, but it could have been done in a much better way. Instead, he's caused this huge divide in the country and made the two extremes even more extreme here in France, really getting rid of what was the center. Ali Aruzi. So, Ali, so I understand by this time tomorrow night, we may know how that authority has ruled, right? How this ruling went down. Exactly. By tomorrow okay. afternoon, Paris time, we'll know what their decision is. Well, then we will, I'm sure, be talking again based on that. Ali Aruzi, thank you very much. Live for us in Paris tonight. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the finish line for the Boston Marathon is finished. 30,000 runners getting ready to go on Monday. You got barricades, bleachers set up all along the route. It's been 10 years since the Boston Marathon bombings, so security will still be ramped up throughout the city. Also out of our Northeast Bureau, police in Philly say a trailer with like $750,000 worth of dimes was robbed this morning. Apparently these dimes were in an unmarked trailer in a parking lot of a Walmart. When officers got there, <laughs> you see what happened. The dimes were all over the place. It's not clear just how much money was taken. Out of our Western Bureau, you're looking at a reunion in Alaska a month in the making. This family's year-old Australian shepherd reportedly disappeared when they were visiting an area near the Bering Strait. Weeks later, people like 150 miles away started posting pictures online of a missing dog. His owners have no idea how he got that far. They think maybe he was hunting or something. Little pups in good health, too. Except for some bite marks from an animal TBD, but he is home getting lots of love from his fam. Still to come. We all know that the ads that we see are already pretty targeted to us, right? But companies are about to up the ante. We'll tell you how they're using AI to do it next. Today, Democrats on Capitol Hill are introducing a new proposal to try to get a handle on national security concerns over AI, while also trying to set the U.S. up to be a leader in this technology, as stuff like ChatGPT gets more and more popular. But concerns about AI are just one side of the coin. It's also a very powerful tool. All of it coming as a new startup is putting AI to work in the advertising industry, helping companies use data from customers to instantly customize the ads that you see with generative AI to basically, they say, get better results. More custom ads, they say, means that you'll probably click on it, you'll probably go there, and then maybe they'll make more money. More clicks, more purchases. Term, turns out audiences are responding to this. Julia Borston is joining us now. Julia, you spoke with the founder of the startup, and he gave you a bit of a demo. Walk us through it. Yeah, this is so interesting to me, Hallie. You know, we talk so much about ChatGPT and how consumers can interact with these AI tools, but this is a tool for brands, for advertisers. It's a business-to-business -business tool that should transform how advertising is made. I'm not talking about the targeting of it, but the testing of it, the creation of those spots. So he explained to me that brands can upload their brand image, whether it's a pair of sunglasses, a shoe, or a car, and then they could create literally thousands of different ads to then test which one's going to be most effective. Take a listen to what the CEO of Scale AI told me about his company. 
You can just generate tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of different uh, possible ads to then test. And you can use some of these ad platforms to immediately take you know, some of these generative, ad, uh, generative AI ads, test them, and see what drives, what drives clicks, what drives, um, what drives a response from their audience. So what's so interesting here is that if they can test all these different ads, they'll find out what works for maybe people who've made certain purchases in the past. And if it works, Hallie, then these ads are going to be more effective, not just for the advertiser. They'll get more people actually buying things, but for consumers, they might actually feel more useful. It's interesting, Julia, because I think there are probably some people who would say it's actually sort of creepy when it's super targeted like this. Like I went shopping for a bathing suit. Two weeks ago, I've seen this bathing suit haunting every website. I've, you know what I mean? Like it's following me across the internet from these targeted ads. Like I get it, but you also think about like the, the privacy piece of it. Can we opt out? How does that come up as part of the conversation here? Well, here's the thing. So much of the creepiness factor is about data that's collected based on your purchases, right? And that actually has very little to do with AI. Now, if AI, in terms of the creation of ads, is working, they're going to show you a bathing suit in exactly the type of setting that is mm. going to make you most likely to buy the bathing suit. You may not even realize it. So I think the question here is whether the ads can be effective without you realizing that AI was part of it. I mean, if they are showing you AI-generated models, you don't want to realize that the models are made with AI. You'd like to believe that some model was flown to a beach and had a, had a photo shoot on the beach somewhere. <laughs> so I think the idea of the AI is they really want it to be seamless. You know what I find really annoying about those ads that follow you around the internet? Is sometimes they're for products that you've already purchased. Don't show me yes. the boots again. I already bought them. So I think <laughs> that's part of it as well. Julia Borson, it's fascinating stuff. Thank you very much for bringing it to us. Appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for watching this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with dramatic new video of the arrest of the guy accused of leaking hundreds of classified documents, sending the intel community scrambling. Look at this, choppers over the suspect's house. With the big question tonight, how did somebody who seemed fairly low level get such high impact access? We'll also take you live to Fort Lauderdale, getting, if you can believe it, even more rain right now after once in a thousand year floods. The airport drenched, closed, schools are closed, what people there are expecting next. We're also live in Indiana where that toxic fires nearly out but questions are just beginning like the big one who's responsible for all of this why people there say they feel like they're in danger plus a stunning development after a top tech executive was stabbed and killed in san francisco with police now saying the cash app founder actually knew his suspected attacker will explain and a new wave of protests over that super controversial plan to raise the retirement age in france we'll take you out live to the ground in paris later in the show Hey there, I'm Hallie, and right now you have more rain. Yes, more rain hitting the area in and around Fort Lauderdale. Only a day after that city got drenched with the most rain it has ever seen. Businesses, schools, the airport, all still closed tonight. People already dealing with feet of water, not inches, getting even more rain as we speak. Homes are messed up. It's a logistical nightmare for travelers because the runways are flooded. Just look at this. It's a wall of water at the airport in Fort Lauderdale. We're going to show you that in a second. There it is. I like, hello, that is why the airport is closed. That is why you can't get into the terminals there. Schools in Broward County, they are out of operation too. Officials today are not even speculating about when classes could get started again. Take a look at how much rain fell all around. 18 inches in Hollywood, 15 inches in the city of Plantation, nearly two feet in Fort Lauderdale. And that is where we find NBC's Guad Venegas, who is whoo, right in the thick of it in Fort Lauderdale. I think we have Guad. I see you have switched to a FaceTime Guad because I assume cell signals are messed up because a storm again is coming through tonight. Correct, Hallie. And we were also standing out here in the middle of the storm with our equipment. Some of that equipment got wet. So the easiest solution was to go to a cell phone because of the amount of rain uh, that we had here. <laughs> You better do this quick because his mic's in and out. And uh, there's still people that were stranded from yesterday 
that's left in these terminals that have been looking for ways to leave the airport. It's been quite difficult for a lot of them to get car rentals. Others were finding a place to go to because, remember, these are uh, travelers that had plans to fly out last night or to fly out at some point today. Some of them telling me, well, we had a hotel, we had a place to stay up until today. So they've been trying to find either a hotel or another place where they can stay at least for another day because it's been announced that the airport will be closed at least until tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, the, the water on the runway did not recede today, and we are now getting even more rain. And this is torrential rain, as you can see behind me. Uh, meanwhile, you know, authorities here have other situations to deal with in Fort Lauderdale, not just the airport. There's neighborhoods that are underwater. There's people that have water that's gone into their homes. Also, cars that we have seen in the Fort Lauderdale area that still uh, need to be helped uh, of individuals that say they haven't been able to find tow trucks or find anyone that can help them get their cars out of those areas. So uh, that's the reason why the city of Fort Lauderdale has declared a state of emergency. Uh, the governor is also sending assistance uh, into the area with authorities hoping that this is the last of that heavy rain that we've gotten yesterday. We had record numbers as much as 25 inches of rain, Hallie. Uh, they say that's about the amount of rain that we would normally get in seven months, but it all came down in just seven Hours. So those are the numbers you can see, uh, these record numbers of rain that came down very, very fast and caused all of this flooding, Hallie. Well, part of it is the issue is, is, is our Bill Karens, I know we'll talk about there. Guadan, you know this area fairly well, right? I know you know South Florida well. It's super flat. There's nowhere for the rain, like, it's tough for the rain to run off, so now they've still got a bunch of water that's standing and more water is dropping on top of it. I mean, that's part of what makes this so challenging. Right, so, so this whole area, and stuff, as you mentioned, we don't have mountains, so when it rains, that water has nowhere to go because of the limestone. It's difficult for that water to go into the ground. We're at sea level in this area. You know, we have also other things changing, sea level rise and the way the land has changed, which has made uh, the flooding much more common for the residents that live here. Uh, but essentially, the way authorities deal with the flooding in South Florida is by using pumps in a certain system that distributes that rainwater to other areas. It's much more complicated than other parts of the country. Uh, where you have higher altitude or the ground can just soak up the water. That's not something that can happen here in South Florida. So authorities are used to the flooding, and there are systems in place uh, to help with the flooding, but this was just too much water too fast that caused the flooding that we have seen, and we continue to see uh, in these images, Ali. Guad Venegas, thank you very much, Guad. I'm glad. Can I just check? You're gonna be, your equipment's going to be okay? Your photographer is somewhere inside trying to off, I hope. Equipment uh, has been, they've been drying the equipment for the last All right. So, you know, now that I've, so the cell phone is and of course, I can get wet. Thank you, Guad. Appreciate uh, you. Thank you for that reporting. So, Bill Karens, there is Guad. You, I mean, yeah. listen, this is what happens. Obviously, like, there are way worse things. Um, but the, the bottom line is this part of Florida is just not getting a break, at least not right now. No, and yeah, I mean, usually we talk about Florida. I, I very rarely talk about flash flooding in Florida because they, it's a lot of sandy soil. Yeah. The, you know, the sand well, we hear absorbs. hurricanes, right? We hear, like, those kinds of things, but... But even when we have hurricanes, we don't typically talk about, like, the type of flash flooding that we get in yeah. other areas of the country because of the soil that can suck it up and it heads down into the aquifer. It just rained so hard, so quickly, it overwhelmed that whole system, and the sandy soil is even saturated at this point. And you saw that the runway behind it still had a lot of rain on it and you know through behind Guad and they've gotten one to two inches of rain in the last hour and I don't know how they're going to open it back up in 11 hours from now I mean I'm just waiting for them to say uh yeah we're not opening it at five well, you know maybe tomorrow afternoon but it's like it's not even just the airports but I'm thinking of like kids in school I mean, I'm used to snow days having grown up in the northeast yeah. they're gonna have to take flood days yeah, from what I've heard, a, a lot, most, not all, most of the neighborhoods, the water receded a lot. It's the area right around the airport that seems to be the worst. And the, the National Weather Service actually went out, Hallie, and they were actually to see where the water marks on the buildings are, because they're curious. Yeah. This is an event that yes. no one's ever seen before. So the highest water mark they saw in the downtown building was three feet. So that's right, you know, that high, you know, on the building. So that's the highest it was anywhere in the city. And you can see by the radar, here's Fort Lauderdale, and one thunderstorm went through, another one's coming up from 
from the south. This is not going to end anytime soon. This will not be 25, 26 inches of rain like yesterday. But, you know, you know, trying to get things back to normal, it may not be till Saturday now. Bill Karens, I'm sure you'll keep us posted. Thank you very much for that update. Appreciate it. So listen, in just the last five minutes, literally, we're learning from two White House officials that President Biden has been briefed about the arrest of the man suspected of leaking hundreds of classified documents as we're seeing new and dramatic videos of federal law enforcement closing in on Jack Teixeira. It's a security breach that's telling us a ton about what the U.S. thinks of the invasion of Ukraine and sending the intel community into a scramble. Uh, at this point, I want to just make sure, I think we have some of that video from our Boston chopper. There it is. You can see it. All right, this is Teixeira's red car that is parked outside. You're going to see the FBI approaching. It looks like they've got an armored car out front, something like that. You see it there. That's all before the moment that you see here. It is the clearest picture of him being patted down. Do you see him on the left side there? You see those other guys in what look to be military-esque gear coming up. They've got Teixeira's hands behind his back. He's wearing that olive green shirt, red basketball shorts. At this point then, he was driven over, loaded up into some cars, the car that actually you see right here, being taken away to the FBI field office in Boston where he just arrived in the last couple of hours. So he's 21 years old, to share it. He's a member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard. He's been in uniform about three and a half years. His official job title, Cyber Transport Systems Journeyman. To, to put that in non-Pentagon speak, he's an IT specialist. Our law enforcement sources say they've been on to him for a long time, days, actually. Attorney General Merrick Garland, you see him there, taking no questions when naming to share it today, only to say he was arrested, and I'm quoting here, without incident. I want to get right to Courtney Cuby at the Pentagon Court. You are the best at demystifying Pentagon speak <laughs> into plain English, right? He's basically, as you point out, this like, like an IT guru, which helps to explain how somebody that's, frankly, pretty young, right, in this position uh, with this rank has access to this kind of high-level stuff. Yeah, that's right. So he's an E3, so he's a pretty junior enlisted airman, yeah. right? And he, 21 years old, which I think a lot of viewers would be surprised that a 21-year-old would have a high-level security clearance, but that's actually not uncommon. Remember, this military is, is a, it's, we're, it's a young military. So someone from, you know, 18 to 25 will frequently have a staggering amount of access or responsibilities in the military. So but beyond that, you mentioned his title. Okay, what that means in civilian speak is, yes, he's an IT guy, but he has the title of journeyman. And what that means in Air Force IT world is he's gone above and beyond. So he's gotten some additional training and additional skills that would give him more access to system, classified systems. So a journeyman will essentially be setting up the, the, the computers and the, uh, the IT system at a location. He was assigned to an intelligence wing at this Massachusetts Air National Guard base near Cape Cod. Uh, so he would have been setting up their most classified systems and had access to them. So the next question a lot of people have is, well, one of the, the, the standards for access to classified systems is, or, or information is not just a security clearance, but there's also this need to know standard, which essentially is if you don't need to know this information, you should have not have access to it. So you may say, well, why does an IT guy have access to some of the most classified systems like the JWIC system, which is essentially this aggregation of operational and classified information from the military all over the world. Why would he have access to something like a JWIC system? Well, because he has a need to know for how that system operates, especially if he's yeah. setting up the computers. So when you put all that together, it starts to make sense why he, why he would have access to all of it. But he would also have the training to know that providing that information outside of a, a secure yeah. facility is wrong. And, and, and he would have had that, supposed that to training. do that, right? Exactly. Okay, so as you were speaking, Courtney, like quite literally as you were doing this live shot, we heard from the person in the building where you are, the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. I want to read a part of this statement, Court. Um, I know I'm reading it to you, I think, fresh here. Uh, he essentially commends the DOJ and the FBI for their swift arrest, the arrest that we just showed on camera just a couple of minutes ago, captured by our choppers from our Boston station here. He says he pledges, of course, the full support and cooperation of the DOD to this investigation. He, he makes the point that you just made here, saying every Every service member, civilian, and contractor with access to this kind of sensitive information has a legal and moral obligation to safeguard it. And then he says something interesting, that he's directing an undersecretary to review intel access, accountability, and control procedures. That's lingo for, like, the way that this stuff is looked at um, to, to make sure that this doesn't happen again. What would a review like that court look like? Like, what is the—I mean, the DOD has already got pretty tight security, presumably. Like, what else could they do? 
But this information goes to a very wide group of people. So I think this is uh, going to include a look at who has access to these things and then accountability on at each individual place. Why was somebody able to print out what appears to be printouts, multiple classified documents, and then walk out of a secure facility with them? Those are the kinds of things that need to be reviewed here. Courtney QB, uh, live for us at the Pentagon. Lots of moving pieces. Court, thank you for being all over it. Appreciate it. Tonight, the fight over an abortion pill is getting another step closer to the Supreme Court, with the DOJ planning to ask the justices to block a new ruling that makes it harder to get access to this pill. That's after an appeals court overnight essentially stopped this medication from being able to be sent to patients in the mail. So if the Supreme Court does not weigh in, it could kick in as soon as Saturday. I mean, starting then, women would have to go to a doctor's office to get the drug. They'd have to take it under the supervision of a doctor. They wouldn't be able to take it at home or to get it sent to them. It comes as Florida lawmakers just tonight are passing what could become one of the strictest abortion bans in the country. I want to bring in Dasha Burns on the ground for us live in Tallahassee. And let's start with this bill that has just now passed the Florida House. It had already passed the Senate. It goes to the desk of Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. If he signs it, it, it would kind of turn the South into what some abortion access advocates have described as an abortion desert. Explain that. Yeah, that's exactly right, Hallie, because if you look at a map of this region, you've got Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana with all out bans. You've got Georgia with a heartbeat ban, which is very similar around six weeks. Right. And now with Florida passing the six week ban, that essentially turns this entire area into a place where it's going to be really, really difficult for women to access abortion care. It means women in Florida are now having to travel uh, over several state lines, likely in order uh, to get that kind of of access and Democrats say, look, at six weeks, a lot of folks don't know that they are pregnant. Republicans, on the other hand, are celebrating this for the most part. Some are even telling me that uh, this six week ban did not go far enough. Some would like to see it go further, look a little bit more like those other states I mentioned that have those those all out bans. Uh, but at the end of the day today, we saw a very heated uh, day in Tallahassee here where protesters uh, came to the Capitol. They were demonstrating here outside of the chamber and inside as well. In fact, that one moment, uh, the speaker had to clear out the gallery because of the tensions inside. T uh, take a look. You have responsibilities to maintain the decorum in the Florida House. If you can't maintain the decorum, I will ask the sergeant to escort you to a room where you can watch the proceedings on the television. Some some Democratic lawmakers also join protesters out here for a few moments. There's not much Democrats can do right now because they are the minority here, though some have talked to me about trying to propose potentially uh, getting this on the ballot as a as a ballot proposition in 2024 and leaving it to the voters. So that might be a difficult uh, challenge because of the way Florida structures those rules. So what the path ahead looks like for those against this bill? Uh, not not so clear, Hallie. Dasha Burns, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. In just the last couple of minutes, we are seeing former President Trump, I mean, I, and I literally mean the last couple of minutes, leaving the New York Attorney General's office in Manhattan after roughly eight hours of deposition. Today's legal challenge is a civil case being led by the state's attorney general. She's accusing Mr. Trump, along with three of his kids, of illegally manipulating how much their assets are worth, perhaps to mislead banks or tax officials or insurance companies. If the AG wins, she could block the Trump family and his company from running other businesses in New York. They could also face a $250 million fine. In a statement, Mr. Trump's attorney says he's got nothing to hide that he looks forward to telling the AG about how successful his company is. As we know, this civil case is just one of multiple cases the former president finds himself in. You see them on your screen, including, of course, the highest profile one, the one that we've talked about most recently, 34 felony charges he faces, accused of lying about business records related to alleged hush money payments. I want to get to Rahima Ellis, who is outside the New York Attorney General's office in Manhattan. Sounds like we had some action and Mr. Trump finally leaving after something like eight hours uh, in that office. Yeah, absolutely. They are just reopening the street to traffic. Former president, literally two minutes ago, his convoy of vehicles, <coughs> excuse me, convoy of vehicles left the underground garage and headed away from the attorney general's office. We are told by spokesperson for the AG's office that the former president spoke and he spoke a lot. Uh, oh. What exactly were the questions? There was no information about that. Uh, said that he 
did take a lunch break. We don't know if he actually had lunch in this course of this eight-hour day, but that there was also another break, a long day. And I'm told by law they can't depose someone for longer than seven hours, so he was given mm. break time. We're also told that the Attorney General, Letitia James, was present in the room for some time, didn't stay the entire time, but she was present in that room. The question was asked whether or not the former president called her a racist, as he did in his on his social media platform when he put out information this morning and last night, and there was no word as to whether or not he made that characterization of the Attorney General uh, during this deposition or to her face while she was in the room. Hallie, mm -hmm. Hallie. I was just going to say, what is so interesting to me is to remind people the, the last time that he sat for a deposition in this case, he was not, as you're reporting here, nearly as vocal. He pleaded the fifth something like 400 times. So it sounds like this was very different than that, obviously. Uh, it is, and there is some reports about the fact that this, this case and that he has now been charged, uh, he's been deposed, and that you have a court date that is set for October 2nd. Uh, there are legal experts who say it is not in a defendant's uh, benefit to take the fifth because it's seen adversely by jurors. So with that kind of a truth being the case here, uh, again, we are told that the former vice president spoke, he answered questions, and he talked a lot. Rahema Ellis, live for us with all of those developments in New York. Rahema, thank you very much. So listen, it's the first day of jury selection in that Dominion Fox trial that's just wrapping up. And even though the judge had the task of finding folks with little to no opinion of Fox or Dominion, the court says they found enough potential jurors to send everybody else home with the jury to be seated Monday. It comes as the judge is also denying requests from media organizations like NBC News to broadcast any bit of this trial from inside court. So 12 jurors and six alternates will ultimately decide whether Fox defamed Dominion by airing lies about their products after the 2020 election. They're talking about the following false claims, things like connections to deceased Venezuelan leader Hugo Chavez, paid kickbacks to politicians, rigged voting machines that flipped votes to then-candidate Joe Biden. None of it, of course, with any evidence. It is defamation, Dominion says, and the biggest defamation case to go to trial in recent memory, with implications for the First Amendment and protections the media has enjoyed for decades. NBC's Jane Tim joins us now from outside court in Wilmington. Um, so, Jane, interesting series of questions here, like, you know, Fox News watchers might have been uh, uh, sort of had the spotlight on them a little bit. People who knew a lot about this Dominion case here. Walk us through what it was like today. Yeah, the questions is a long list of questions for a trial like this, but of course this is a very controversial and high-profile trial. Uh, some of these questions are trying to find people who have personal relationships with witnesses or people being discussed, um, but they're also pretty simple. Like, have you ever had a, have you or a family member or a close friend ever worked in a newsroom? Do you have training in journalism? The kind of things where people might be, where jurors might be relying on outside information in their opinion that they might render in court. Um, but some of them also things like, have you ever served as an election judge? Those are people who might have actually touched a voting machine and seen parts of it, been more involved with it than, say, a regular voter. Uh, they're looking for people who can, they think can be impartial. Now, if you answered yes to any of these questions, it doesn't mean you're getting excused from, from jury duty. Uh, it means the judge is going to question you one-on-one -on -one and ask you why. What he's looking for is if people are going to say, you know what, I have made up my opinion. I can't uh, be swayed by evidence in this case. Uh, that's what they're looking for here. What's also interesting about this is no matter how this case is decided, like what, who wins, who loses, whether it's Fox or Dominion, because of the First Amendment implications, this is going to have reverberations well beyond simply Fox and Dominion. You know, it's easy in a, in a case like this where it's really noisy. There's a lot of headlines. There's thousands of pages of inside emails from Fox that have, have made headlines around to forget that this affects real people. Everyone from the election workers who are uh, working with these election machines and to the county level, people who get harassed over the fact that they have uh, they're mobilized by these, these conspiracy theories, people who are harassing them, advancing those conspiracy theories, right down to journalists, how much you fact check in a fast moving, fast paced moving news environment. Uh, this has implications for all of those. You could see copycat lawsuits if Dominion wins, people going after journalists more, more quickly. Uh, and if Fox News wins, you could also see people saying, like, what is defamation if not this? It's a much higher standard than the already quite high standard 
for defamation. Uh, so these are some of the questions that, that are going to be grappled with, with how this jury rules uh, come, come Memorial Day, right around there. Jane, Tim, thank you very much. Live for us from Wilmington. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, the top Senate Republican sharing when he will head back to the Senate in person after having been hospitalized for a fall. We've got that. Plus, why PBS seems to be ditching Twitter. Coming up in the five things. Stay with us. We have just learned that huge fire that is toxic, right? Sending that cloud of smoke into the air at a recycling plant in Indiana is nearly out. A bit of good news for people in Richmond, the city's fire chief, in just the last hour or so, saying that this fire that's been burning for more than two days could be extinguished as soon as tonight. Schools are still going to stay closed tomorrow for a third day, and people are still evacuated with no timeline on when they'll be able to get back to their homes. You can see it. It was super black smoke two days ago. Now you see some gray smoke, too, filling the air. Our reporters on the ground say the smell of the burning plastic is stronger than ever right now as we start to see what little is left of that factory. The big question tonight, who's going to be held accountable for all this? The city's already in a court fight with the owner of this plant over a possible fire hazard even before this fire started. Jesse Kirsch is live for us in Indiana. So a bit of a glimmer of hope for people with this fire potentially set to be out as soon as tonight. Does it mean they could get back into their houses more quickly? Does it mean they can get kids back into school more quickly? Yeah, so Hallie, we know that the conditions that officials have laid out for when they will let people come back to their homes within the evacuation zone is that the fire has to be completely extinguished and they want to have the plume under control. At this point, the last official word we have here is that the fire is 90% extinguished. So that's close, but that's not over the finish line yet. And obviously there's also the, the added uh, hurdle of making sure that the plume is contained. And we know that with the wind and even the air temperature, the movement of that plume of smoke has changed over the last couple of days. So those are things that we're still watching for before we'll see people coming back into the evacuation zone within a half mile of this facility. But the damage and the concern in this community is already done, including among for some people that our team has spoken with. Here's what one man told us about his concern for his family. I feel like we're in you know, a lot of danger. I have three or four year old grandchildren. You know, what's the long term effect of this stuff going to be, you know, throughout their lifetimes? And obviously, people in this community have questions about what they've been breathing in over the last couple of days. We know that there has been air monitoring ongoing. We're waiting for further testing results. So far, though, officials have said at the site specifically behind me here, Allie, very, I want to be very clear about this. At Please. the site itself, they say they have found volatile organic compounds. Yeah. They haven't gone into more specifics as to what those compounds are. So we don't know specifically what types of volatile organic compounds have been found. However, we know that a subgroup of that can include cancer causing substances. And again, to be very clear, this is what has been found at the site itself. We're waiting for further testing to figure out exactly which types of compounds have been found here. But so far, there have not been any indications from officials that those types of materials have been found in the air in the community at large. So that should bring some relief to people uh, to know that nothing like that, no alarm bell like that has been set off yet. But obviously, uh, people are going to be wanting to find out more yeah. about what broader testing shows in the days ahead here, Hallie. What is clear, Jesse, even with some of these questions out there, is that this is going to be a multi-step road to trying to get back to some semblance of normal. Jesse Kirsch, live for us in Richmond. Thank you. We are learning late tonight from police that the tech executive killed in San Francisco last week knew the man suspected of attacking him. Police say Nima Mamemi is a tech consultant. He's expected to be arraigned tomorrow. And you'll remember that the death of Bob Lee, the founder of Cash App, triggered this national debate over public safety issues in San Francisco, with the DA today using the announcement of this arrest to call out Elon Musk, who tweeted after the stabbing that violent crime in San Francisco is horrific. Listen. Reckless and irresponsible statements like those contained in Mr. Musk's tweet that assumed incorrect circumstances about Mr. Lee's death serve to mislead the world in their perceptions of San Francisco and also negatively impact the pursuit of justice for victims of crime. The arrest comes just over a week after Lee was found stabbed just before 3 a.m. 
in the sort of main area of San Francisco's downtown. Nayala Charles is joining us now. And Nayala, I understand that just in the last couple of minutes, we've heard from the family of Bob Lee. What are they saying? Yeah, Bob Lee's family is expressing gratitude to the San Francisco Police Department for this arrest tally now nine days after Bob Lee was stabbed to death in San Francisco. I want to read you part of the statement they gave to us. It says, every day around the world, people interact with technology that Bob helped create. Bob will live on through these interactions and his dreams of improving all of our lives. Now, the suspect in this case, Nima Momeni, is set to be arraigned tomorrow. At that point, Hallie, prosecutors say that they will be requesting that he be held without bail. And as part of that, they're going to have to argue why they are requesting that and why they want it. So we expect to learn more details about the suspect tomorrow. Let me go to the, so we're looking ahead to the arraignment here, and we've heard that candidly strong statement from the DA here, um, really making clear that they had major concerns about some of the framing around this attack in the days after it happened. Do we know anything else? Did they reveal anything else about specifically the motive, the connection between these two, anything more broadly about this? Right. No, they still haven't released a possible motive here. The police chief telling us that because it's in an open investigation, there's still a lot of questions they're trying to answer. Listen to what he told us. There's people that we need to talk to. There's evidence that we need to continually develop and corroborate. There's forensic evidence that we're waiting to hear back from our forensics uh, team. So there's a lot going on that we just need to continue to develop. And we can't talk about it right now. You know, it just would not be helpful for this investigation. Hallie, but what the police chief is saying is that this wasn't a random attack. And the police believe that the murder weapon in this case that was used to kill Bob Lee was a knife. Nyala Charles, live for us in California tonight. Uh, Nyala, thank you very much for that reporting. A lot of new developments even just this evening. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the top Senate Republican, Mitch McConnell, says he's coming back to work in person on Monday. Remember, he's been working from home the past couple of weeks, ever since he got out of rehab after tripping and falling at a dinner here in Washington last month. He was in the hospital with broken ribs and a concussion. Number two, President Biden oversees in Ireland. Look at this, attending a big banquet at a castle in Dublin after meeting with the country's president and prime minister and speaking with parliament. If you forgive the poor attempted Irish, Tamasha Walia, I'm at home. Tomorrow, he's planning to visit another ancestral area of his. Remember, he's tying a lot of the personal with the political on this trip before he heads back to Washington. Number three, it appears PBS is getting off Twitter. They haven't posted since Saturday, and a rep for the public TV station tells Variety that it stopped tweeting from its account after being labeled as government-funded media. PBS says U.S. governmental money makes up like 15% of its revenue. NPR announced yesterday it'll shut down its official Twitter accounts over that same label. Number four, California's Disneyland says the Splash Mountain ride there will close at the end of May. Remember, this ride, we've covered it before, got a lot of criticism for its racist roots. It's been around for 30 years, but is getting a total makeover. It'll reemerge as like a Princess and the Frog-inspired ride. The Splash Mountain at Disney World closed back in January. Number five, big news for those of you going to Coachella tomorrow. The vast slice of our audience who is going to be attending Coachella. Blink-182, they're going to be surprising you there. Their first reunion show in like a decade, their tour, is starting next month. Have, if you are going to Coachella, have a great time. Let's come back with a little bit of breaking news here. Texas County just voting to keep its entire public library system open after considering shutting it down when a judge ordered them to put previously banned books back into circulation. Tonight, we had our station in Austin's affiliate cameras inside this Llano County Commissioner's special meeting where the head of that commission, Ron Cunningham, ended the meeting. Listen. For those of you that don't understand what just happened, we have really removed the agenda item. The library will remain open. We will try this in the courts, not through social media or through news media. That little community right outside Austin has become the latest front in this so-called culture war fight, all over about a dozen books, mostly for kids, like the classic In the Night Kitchen by Maurice Sendak, Larry the Farting Leprechaun, but also some books about race and social justice, like Cast, Origins of Our Discontent. 
A lawsuit filed by some people in Lano said, hey, bring these banned books back. And a judge ultimately agreed, saying it was unconstitutional to keep them out of circulation. He said, put them back in. Aaron Gilchrist had been following all of this for us. And what's interesting is the judge said, put them back in. So then the county, some of them, there was some discussion that they were going to come back and say, fine. You want, you want us to unban these books? We're going to shut down the whole library. They did not do that. Why? Yeah, money. It's money, really okay. Really boils down to it here. The, the, the county judge, who we just heard from for the first time, really, there have been media outlets trying to get him to respond to questions about all this. And essentially, he said the county had already spent $100,000 dealing with this lawsuit that was filed last year by okay. these residents. They didn't want to, I think, ultimately deal with more lawsuits. So they said, all right, we'll, we'll do what the judge said. We'll put the books back. We'll keep the libraries open while we continue to deal with the legal uh, maneuvering around this this particular lawsuit that's still actually in place. There's still some some pieces of that that need to be talked about okay. in the courts. But people who came into this meeting, the room was packed. It was full to capacity. There were people outside as wow. well on both sides of the issue. The folks who wanted to keep the library open said, you know, this is censorship and we need these libraries. They're an important part of the community. They are an important resource for yeah. students doing research, looking for books to read. People and so getting the libraries online, whatever. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. What did people on the other side say? Though? I mean, we heard, um, I heard from one woman, we were talking about this last hour, who said we should temporarily close these libraries while we work out this whole book issue. And that was the argument that was still made in the meeting tonight. People said, you know, there are books in the library that young people should not have access to. They made accusations about pornography in some of the children's books that were in the library system. And that was the argument they made while they were speaking at this meeting as well. There were also, while the judge, while the commissioners were having their, their executive session, there were people who were praying in the room. Mm -hmm. There was singing of Amazing Grace. There were uh, folks who in their, their testimony opportunity, uh, got up and read pieces of um, adult-themed books uh, that they said were a part of mm. the, the problem in this okay. system. We want you to hear from one man who uh, spoke after the public speaking part of this and just talked to our local affiliate about what uh, his feelings were around this issue. I'm hoping to resolve, finally, an issue with what we consider pornography and even child pornography at our public library. I would rather see the county library closed than permit children to have these books. And that was the attitude that a lot of people had, but and we know now the yeah. libraries will stay open, the three libraries in Lano County. As you say, money behind it, yeah. you know. Uh, Aaron Gokers, thank you. It's fascinating yeah. stuff. Appreciate it. When we come back, after years of controversy, years, the owner of the Washington Commanders is reportedly on his way out with something like $6 billion. What we're finding out tonight and what it means for all those investigations into the team, next. So the owner of the frankly, embattled Washington Commanders, that's fair to say, is reportedly close to a deal to sell his team for a whole $6 billion, that's a record, or it would be, for any franchise, for any sport in North America. You may be asking, Hallie, okay, like, you live in D.C., I get it. Why is this a national news story? We are not talking about the sale of just any sports team, right? We are not talking about an owner, right, just any owner of a sports team. This is Dan Snyder in the spotlight because of a series of allegations from a toxic culture on the team that includes sexual harassment of cheerleaders, allegedly, and female employees, to allege financial misconduct and bank fraud. Congress is looking into some of this. Snyder has denied all of the allegations you see on your screen. The new owners are reportedly led, potential owners, we should say, are reportedly led by a group that includes Josh Harris, who also owns the 76ers and the NHL's New Jersey Devils, as well as Magic Johnson. You see him there, NBA Hall of Famer, who's a part owner of the Dodgers in L.A. Ben Standig of The Athletic joins me now. I know there are Commanders fans out there tonight, Ben, who are like, finally, relief. I mean, I know some of those Commanders fans personally, right? But this is certainly not a done deal yet, the sale. Not a done deal. They've come to an agreement in principle. It's not exclusive, though. So in theory, somebody else could jump in. There was uh, another group coming out of Canada that had that, that put in a bid for essentially the same $6 billion. So I think they still think they're involved. Okay. But at this point, it looks like Josh Harris. I think the big question that a lot of people have, and I will tell you a big question that I have, because we've covered the saga of Dan Snyder and these allegations, again, in D.C. Like, there's a lot to this. What does this potential sale mean for all of those investigations against Snyder? We heard from the lawyers who represent more than 40 commanders employees who say today marks the end of a long and difficult chapter for workers. 
Tell me what this means writ large for those accusations. I think those accusations are still going forward. The uh, there's a. D.C. has uh, has a situation right. going on involving not just the insider, but the NFL and how everything's been handled. Uh, Eastern District of Virginia is looking into bank fraud. Uh, the NFL's own investigation, uh, for, led by uh, right. Mary Jo White, still looking into allegations made against the insider specifically, as well as um, how the, the, the uh, organization handled their own finances. All these things are still going forward. What happens? Do we start? Do we continue to talk about it in the same way? I don't know about that. Dan Snyder supposedly was looking for uh, cover from the league if he were to go ahead and sell. And I think that is a question that we all have asked. Is he going to be held accountable if, uh, you know, what, depending on what happens? Pull that thread. Explain what you mean. Do you mean that if he becomes now a former owner, that perhaps the NFL might not be so, the speculation is that the NFL would be less aggressive in going after him? Or, or help, help well, us understand that. In terms of the, their own investigation, right. I think we all are kind of wondering What's going to happen? Okay. Roger Goodell just repeated the other day at the uh, owners' meeting that they will release these findings. Okay. What those findings will look like, that's going to be the question. And you know, how scrubbed over is it, I guess? Uh, we'll, we'll see. But the rest of it, yeah, everybody's still going forward. I believe I saw uh, the D.C. Uh, Attorney General today said they are still moving forward on their case, and the Washington Post reported that. So, yeah, he, Dan Snyder is not off the hook as far as we know with any of this, but nonetheless— it, 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 people may pull back to a degree if that. he's out of the way. A question mark is what you're saying there. Yeah. Sure, sure, he may not be off the hook. He's going to be richer by a lot because $6 billion is a tremendous amount of money. I don't think I have to tell you that or anybody that. He bought the team for $800 million back in 1999. What was the leverage factor here? How did he get so much for this team? Is it because the NFL writ large is just so darn lucrative? Right. Even if it be, it's viewed like Dan Snyder selling a distressed property, it's not. It's the NFL. Yeah. It is the cash cow of cash cows, and people want to get into that exclusive club. There's only obviously 32 owners for these teams. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's why people were willing to do it. Josh Harris, as we mentioned, he last year tried to buy the Denver Broncos, mm. came up short there. He obviously owns an NBA and an NHL team. Now he adds to that portfolio. Uh, um, Magic Johnson was with him trying to get the Denver bid. Now he's here as well. So, yeah, whatever Dan Snyder is dealing with, they want the team. You know, it's funny. A lot of people in D.C., there was some speculation. Could it be Jeff Bezos? Could he be making him play? It turns out, not the case here. That would always seem to be a bit a, a weird wishful one. thinking yeah. that people are like, it makes sense on some levels. But he, and he did show some interest, but never got any real sense that he was a real bidder on this. Ben Stanek, thank you very much. I'm sure this is not the last time we'll talk. Appreciate Thanks. it. Coming up, big protests across France today because of a big decision set to come tomorrow on this move to try to raise the retirement age. We're talking with our reporter on the ground in Paris. Coming up. Plus, why a spokesperson for a top Putin critic in Russia thinks he's being slowly poisoned. That's later in The Local. Tonight, a new wave of protests across France with something like half a million people marching across the country against this unpopular plan from the president to raise the retirement age there. You saw demonstrators swarming the Paris headquarters of luxury giant LVMH, saying the French government should tax the rich more instead of making people work longer. The head of that company, Bernard Arnault, is the world's richest person. Also in the city, you had confrontations in Bastille Square. Police, you see, stepping in. They used tear gas to try to disperse people. It's all ahead of a critical day tomorrow when the top constitutional council in France was going to issue a decision on this basically change to retirement plans. Demonstrators aren't going to be allowed near where this vote's happening tomorrow until Saturday morning. Alia Ruzzi joins me now from Paris. Tomorrow, you got this reform law that goes to a vote. Is it possible they could scrap the plan or scrap parts of it? Well, Holly, this entire fate of this bill now lands, uh, is in the hands of this uh, Constitutional Council, and they could decide to scrap it altogether or fully support President Macron. Now, traditionally, that council has usually supported the president's office, and the conventional wisdom here is that they will do so again tomorrow, perhaps with some caveats. And the reason is that most of the people on that council are seen as Macronists. They see eye to eye with him on this uh, pension 
pension reform plan. They think this is needed to balance the books in the country. And if that doesn't happen, the situation here could be far worse. And they're very keen to resolve this situation because the country has come to a sort of a standstill. These strikes have affected everything here from air transport, ground transport, health care, oil refineries, schools, and even garbage collection. So it's really, really affecting the economy and the day-to-day -day works of the country, and they want to resolve it. But what's for sure, Hallie, is whether this bill goes through or not tomorrow, the divide between these two sides couldn't be bigger. What's interesting here, too, is that Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, is set to visit Notre Dame with his wife tomorrow before they sort of mark the anniversary of the fire there. He's getting out in the streets. Protests be damned in some ways. What's, what's the sense of the reporting around his attitude towards this tonight, meaning the protests, the demonstrations, the controversy now that has been lasting for weeks over this pension change plan? Well, it's a kind of a message from Macron that it's just another day at the office. It's a business as usual. And he's probably feeling pretty confident that this bill is going to go through tomorrow, possibly with a caveat or two, and he will have gotten his way. And of course, Kali, he doesn't have that much to lose. He keeps saying that he doesn't mind how unpopular this bill uh, makes him, but he doesn't have to worry about opinion polls and getting reelected because the French constitution only allows two terms. So it doesn't matter if this bill goes through and he's terribly unpopular. But what a lot of commentators here are saying is that he hasn't really selected a clear leader to follow him and his party. And if this bill does go through and there's still a lot of commotion in this country, it again, it hangs in the balance. There's no clear leader to make sure it works. And the argument here is that he just hasn't gone about this properly. There is an argument for raising the pension, but it could have been done in a much better way. Instead, he's caused this huge divide in the country and made the two extremes even more extreme here in France, really getting rid of what was the center. Ali Aruzi. So, Ali, so I understand by this time tomorrow night, we may know how that authority has ruled, right? How this ruling went down. Exactly. By tomorrow okay. afternoon, Paris time, we'll know what their decision is. Well, then we will, I'm sure, be talking again based on that. Ali Aruzi, thank you very much. Live for us in Paris tonight. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. In Russia, a spokesperson for Putin critic Alexei Navalny says he's got really bad stomach pain that could be from some kind of slow-acting poison. The spokesperson telling Reuters there's no proof of it and that he couldn't eat the prison food because it was making him feel worse. The prison service there has previously denied accusations that its employees have mistreated Navalny. It did not immediately respond to Reuters' request for comment. From Australia, Cyclone Ilsa was a Category 5 storm before making landfall in the western part of the country there. Winds gusting at like 180 miles an hour. The Australian Bureau of Meteorology says this cyclone, a.k.a. hurricane in the southern hemisphere, started slowing down when it went over land. We don't have a lot of images yet. It's only like six something in the morning there now. But fortunately for now, no reports of any injuries. From Germany, meet Fatu, the oldest gorilla in the world, 66 years young, celebrating today at the zoo in Berlin. For context, the average gorilla in their lifespan is about 40. So how did Fatu celebrate? Look at this, with a little fresh fruit, changing it up from her typical veggies. She didn't have to share with anybody. The zoo has five other gorillas, but Fatu has her own pen because she is older and deserves a little solo time. Still to come. We already know that the ads we see are pretty targeted to us, but companies are about to up the ante. We're going to tell you how they're using AI to do it next. Today, Democrats on Capitol Hill are introducing a new proposal to try to get a handle on national security concerns about AI, while also trying to set up the U.S. to be a leader in this kind of tech, with stuff like chat GPT getting more and more popular. But concerns about AI are just one side of the coin. It's also a pretty powerful tool. All coming as a new startup is putting AI to work in the advertising industry, helping customers, companies rather, use data from all of us that instantly customize the ads you see. They say better ads, more custom ads, means you'll probably click on it, means they'll probably make some more money off of it. Turns out, audiences are responding to this. 
Julia Borston has more. The future of advertising is here, thanks to generative artificial intelligence. The uh, models that are generated here are not real people. This is a fully AI-generated model. Don't need to hire the model. You don't need to hire the cameraman. That's what Scale AI offers marketing agencies and brands. Alex Wang, CEO of Scale AI, a startup valued at over $7 billion, says his tools blow up the bottleneck that slows down advertising teams by enabling them to use their clients' data sets to instantly customize ad images with generative AI to test what drives the highest return on ad investment. You can just generate tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of different uh, possible ads to then test. And you can use some of these ad platforms to immediately take you know, some of these generative AI ads, test them, and see what drives clicks, what drives a response from their audience. Other startups, such as ChatGPT rival Jasper, offer AI software to accelerate ad content creation. You can create eye-catching marketing and advertising copy in seconds. And Meta says it's working on the ability for brands to use generative AI to create ads. For now, it offers AI tools to A-B test ads and quickly improve. And while while Google has integrated AI into ad creation and targeting for years, it hasn't yet launched generative AI options. But we can expect this next generation technology to proliferate, delivering instantly customized ads and for brands, likely better results. And you can see this car on, mm -hmm. uh, on these icy roads in wow. the middle of... Uh, it's like a car is driving down the road. I know, exactly. Julia, this is so interesting, right? But as we sort of laid out in the introduction here, there's always two so two sides to every coin. I get why companies would dig this. What, what about any pushback against it? Well, look, consumers may not even notice. Many of those images he showed me, I would have no idea. They were generated yeah. without a photographer, without a model with AI, but there has already been some pushback. Levi said that they were going to be doing some AI-generated models to model their clothing because they wanted to have more diverse models. So that drew pushback because people said, if you want more diverse models, you don't have to generate them in AI, with AI. You can just hire them. So certainly there's going to be a lot of backlash, especially if you think about all the people who could be losing jobs um, because they're not necessary in the process necessarily. Julia Borston, thank you so much for that um, fascinating look at the way AI is infiltrating every aspect, it seems, of our life. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for joining us on this Thursday night. That does it for this hour. More tomorrow, of course, same time, same place, right here on NBC News Now. Top story starts right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.